Welcome to Healthcare Upside Down with your host, Dr. Nick Vanterhaven, and brought to you by ECG Management Consultants. You can learn more about the show on the program's page at healthcarenowradio.com or on our blog at ecgmc.com slash hud. The U.S. spends more on healthcare per capita than any other country on the planet. So why don't we have superior outcomes? Why haven't the principles of capitalism prevailed? And why do American consumers have so much trouble accessing and paying for healthcare? Each week, Healthcare Upside Down will dive into these and other issues with ECG principal, Dr. Nick, and guest panelists as they discuss the upsides and downsides of healthcare in the US and how to make the system work for everyone. And we end with your better pill to swallow, the conclusion to today's episode with insights on challenges and changes that improve healthcare. Now here's your host, Dr. Nick. There are certainly mixed feelings in many parts of society around the introduction of technology and what that means to individuals and to our society. You can trace this back a long way in history into Roman and Greek times when the new technology of writing was introduced. And at the time, Plato was concerned that young students would learn to rely too much on the written word at the expense of their ability to remember. These concerns repeat many times in history with the introduction of technology. The printing press, books, newspapers, steam power, photography, the telegraph, the telephone, radio, television, computers, and the internet, to name but a few. At each juncture, there's a broad resistance with large groups pushing back for fear of loss of their existing world that they have become accustomed to all the while blaming the new technology for current problems. Innovation certainly brings about change, and some of it can be highly disruptive and often requires a change to what we do and how we fit into the new model of our world. In some cases, those very technology innovations are contributory to the resistance as people tell stories, write books, imagining potential outcomes and dystopian worlds. Innovation and advances come with change and a responsibility to mitigate and address possible downsides. But as we have seen through history, it is impossible to stop advances. And even if we could, should we be resisting change? Many will have seen the movie series that started with The Terminator, almost 40 years old at this point, but still poignant in the picture it painted of a world impacted by artificial intelligence that resulted in the mass extinction of human life when the fictional Skynet became aware. But is that our future with the rapid advances in machine learning, artificial intelligence and deep learning? And if so, what can we and should we be doing about it? Join me on Healthcare Upside Down Show as I talk with Dr. Michael Abramoff, a professor of ophthalmology and of electrical and computer engineering and biomedical engineering at the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics, and he's also the Executive Chairman of Digital Diagnostics. Hi, Michael. Welcome to the show. It's so exciting to be here. Thanks for uh, having me. So, uh, breakthrough uh, classification from the FDA for fully autonomous capabilities with an artificial intelligence from a diagnostic standpoint that's a pretty significant move. What does that mean for medicine? I think it was a, a, a big watershed moment. I think there's tremendous potential and we're already seeing that for essentially bringing high quality healthcare to every patient that, that needs it and deserves it. Meaning you can do something about health disparities that's happening. You can improve quality of care. We're seeing that uh, you can improve clinical outcomes. Uh, I can tell you about that. We're seeing that in in the field. Uh, You can lower cost or at least see to actually get the care to all the patients that need it rather than a smaller subset, about 20 to 30%, which we're currently seeing, meaning for the same expenditure, you can broaden access to healthcare to everyone who needs it. We're seeing that also. So intuitively... I hear you and say, well, this is great. We're going to expand access. We're going to reduce costs. Those are parts of the the sort of the intention of healthcare systems to broaden access. And those are key elements. But as I think about this as a clinician, I go, well, what does this mean to me? Am I now being um, moved out of the process and essentially replaced? 
And that's a, a great question. And I've seen that concern before. In fact, I was giving the nickname the, the Retinator, like the Terminator for the Retina in 2010 in a big editorial about you know my work. And so I've seen that. This was the the one of the leaders in ophthalmology, the chair of ophthalmology at Hopkins. And that was about concern for job loss and quality of care loss. And so I think, uh, A, we need to be very transparent what we're doing here, very clear uh, about the scientific evidence and what's going on. So that's part of it. The other part is what you're actually seeing is that specialists, like in this case, my colleagues, ophthalmologists and retina specialists in particular, they want to operate at the top of the license. Having an AI that makes this diagnosis where the patients actually are, which is in the field, in primary care, in retail clinics, finding those patients that actually need the high quality care that these ophthalmologists and specialists can give actually makes them, you know, do their work better, make them actually realizes that top of, uh, top of license practicing that, they, that everyone wants. So there's a part of me that is envious that you got compared to uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I, I'm going to say. But there's also, I, I, you know, some sympathy because that could be seen as a negative, And I think in this particular instance, probably was. You, you clearly have a passion around this that says this is not about replacing, but facilitating better care. I think we've seen or at least I've certainly seen some instances Without the full clinical oversight, and I think my, my recollection was Luca Pia, where they were analyzing publicly available images and saying, can we find something and alert people to potential problems? And that was around, um, uh, it, you know, a, a positive impact, but didn't take on a full functioning medical tool set. You've obviously moved the needle and, and, and improved on that in a way that is very significant, but there are some catches in there. How have you dealt with that? Well, in fact, this, this retinator thing was not great at the time it happened, but actually it was really good it happened. It made very, very clear that even though at that time, the technology or the algorithms, we, we use machine learning, there's some you know, ways we can discuss about the actual algorithms and machine learning and deep learning. But I think we, we were sort of there in terms of performance. We knew it could be done, but that is not enough. It's not enough to have the almost engineering tech side of making sure that it works and that's enough. And if the science is done, let's just do it. There were clearly very many societal concerns about using AI in healthcare, especially in an autonomous fashion. And that needed to be addressed. And so it's, it was very clear that if we don't address it up front and make it very clear what we're doing, it would not work. It would not be accepted by all stakeholders in healthcare. So from that moment on in 2010, a lot of work has been done about what I call the ethics for AI in healthcare. I, 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 I call that metrics for ethics because if you're an engineer and have a computer engineering background, you want to be able to measure what you do. And just saying be ethical is not very useful to an engineer, especially when you're trying to make an autonomous AI for use in healthcare. How much am I meeting certain ethical principles? And there's many of them. And, you know, I don't know whether your readership is, uh, listenership is, is interested, but there's a few autonomy of the patient, mm -hmm. benefit or harm to the patient, beneficence or maleficence. There's something called justice, which is about applying it equally well to all patients and it's finally responsibility and we get into liability and medical malpractice insurance and so and there's many of them there's patients and patient organizations there's physicians and other providers there's payers uh, there's regulators and there's bioethicists and they all have a say in how, how we do healthcare and what is what is good and bad and what we should introduce and not making creating this, this metrics for ethics and this ethical framework that was later published as scientific research allowed us to both build a regulatory framework working very closely with FDA. And that continues to this day. How do I prove it's safe? How do I prove it is effective? What does the clinical trial look like? Do I compare my AI in performance to physicians or maybe to clinical outcome, which is what we did, which is more important for patients and payers? So instead of proving that the AI compares really well to one or more physicians. Instead, we proved it really predicts well 
the outcome of the patients if they're not managed and treated properly. So many of these aspects were addressed in the eight years that we worked together with FDA to ensure the clinical trial was done right. There was no AI racial bias or ethnic bias in the AI in the performance, transparency, um, what we call uh, validability, the different aspects that you understand why the AI makes the decision it does so we can trust it. But that was only one part, this regulatory aspect. This ethical framework also helped with the more reimbursement aspect because as you uh, listeners may know, there's now also a nationwide Medicare reimbursement for this autonomous AI decision at a blended level of about $80, both private payers and Medicare is paying for it. And that's unique as well. And there are also these reimbursement decisions have the input from all stakeholders in healthcare, including patients. And again, this ethical framework really helped with, with this aspect of getting this to patients, because ultimately, if you do not have regulatory approval, if you do not have a reimbursement, it's really hard to get this to the patients that need it. So it was a long journey, but coming back to this metrics for ethics, I think that was essential. And now you see that the American Academy of Ophthalmology, a provider organization, a professional organization, is one of the strongest supporters. The American Medical Association has, has said that we do AI the right way, as well as payers. Everyone, American Diabetes Association, which is a patient organization, ensured that this autonomous AI is part of the standard of care for diabetes. So you can see our essentially everyone, based on this transparency, based on these ethics, said, yeah, this is what we want for patients. So I, it, it's interesting. It, it feels like you, you've shifted from, you know, what was perceived to be a bad actor by some of the uh, interested parties to a positive contributor in terms of defining the overall um, methodology, the ethics underlying all of this. You know, much like the Terminator movies, he went from being from bad to, you know, really good. So, again, that analogy works quite well in this particular instance. Um, and I know this is a little bit unfair uh, before we talk about the, the, the jump point and where this might go. But as you look back at that overnight success, because most people look at this and say, well, this, you know, breakthrough. But it wasn't. It, you know, you said eight. I I think even longer than that was there an inflection point of, of something that was what was critical to the success of this was it centered on that uh, ethical uh, mindset what what helped you change the thinking and allow people to get on board where was where was the criticality in that great and and you know looking back I, I want to make two remarks and then we'll get back to your point um, I think I've been working on this for more than 30 years, uh, re originally as a neuroscientist trying to mimic the brain, later realizing that as I was doing my residency in ophthalmology, realizing that patients just were not getting the care they needed. Um, and why not use a computer to mimic my brain and get into where the patient is? Um, I think two realizations. A, the first one was pretty early. It cannot be about the tech, what I call Glamour AI, which is really cool technology that doesn't help patients. And in this case, AI. So AI is really exciting, but this doesn't benefit patients. Why do it? So A, I needed to persist beyond you know, the patterns, the scientific studies, et cetera, which meant the, the big decisions we made rather than break the system, work within the healthcare system and try to get us across, which as you 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 know you noticed with the retinator remark, that was not easy at first. Mm. But I think taking that hat on was a big decision. And we could have also skirted away from this and, and try to do it differently or just keeping the scientific research saying, well, once it's perfect, people will surely accept it. That's just not how it works. You need to go in there, essentially get your hands dirty and make sure that it works for actual patients in actual clinics and actual workflow. And there's a lot of things I can say about that. I think the other inflection points really came with what, what you called liability or responsibility, where I think people were nervous about AI and who's going to be held medically liable if we have this computer making a medical diagnosis in patients. And so we decided to say, well, we will show the medical liability for the performance of the AI, what we prove 
with the FDA, with the clinical trials, with their continuous efficacy monitoring, because FDA asked us and we wanted to monitor uh, de novo authorization, as it's called. And so assuming this responsibility was really, really important, I think, for wider acceptance and making other things happen. But ultimately, it need, you know, it also required to dig into ethics and essentially create an ethical framework. So uh, clearly you've shifted this whole domain, albeit I, I think relatively narrow at this point, I, I, in no other form, just in a specialty. Um, but that's a revolution that's coming for other parts. And there are, I think, some obvious targets. I mean, you're talking about image analysis. So radiology springs immediately to mind. I think we've seen some, certainly dermatology. Um, having blazed the trail, where do you think the quick wins, if there is such a thing at this point, having made, I think, the significant difference in terms of acceptance and moving the needle, where do you think we can go with this? Yeah, so you make a great point about, it sounded a bit long when, because we did it for the first time, we have published a lot on, on frameworks, regulatory frameworks with FDA. Uh, a few days a paper uh, of us came out about a reimbursement framework for AI and specifically autonomous AI that was published in Nature Digital Medicine just a few days ago. Um, so I think with that groundwork done, it's much more easy and acceptable to go through the same process much faster. And indeed, because we're seeing and patients are seeing advantages in healthcare, systems are seeing the advantages on their patients, better outcomes, we're seeing that better access, and especially in minorities, we're seeing that all over the US where we have implemented it, cost reduction, right? Uh, we're seeing that. If I, uh, I if I get reimbursed by Medicare, it's about $170, where the rate for this one is $55, as I mentioned. So immediate cost saving, and therefore being able to do it on more patients. But as you see that evidence, you know, already being there, and of course, expanding over the over the next few years, it's logical to think what is next. Well, we have a few. One is for skin cancer. Uh, you may have heard about that. Again, the same front lines of care, retail clinics, primary care. Um, that's where patients are and that's where they need this diagnosis. There's many others, including not only using images, but also sound um, for cardiovascular disease. There's even things, more things you can do with the retina. What is interesting with the retina is you look at both neural tissue and also at vascular tissue, uh, without using, you know, radiation or without using a, a dye or, or a contrast, which, by the way, is really doing more cardiovascular risk assessment just from the retina, as well as, for example, with ultrasound. So, yes, there's an enormous potential now to increase this access in a number of different diagnoses. And I agree, it will in, initially be very narrow specialty diagnoses but it can expand to dozens of them, even in the next two to three years, I expect. So I, I, certainly exciting times. We've seen a, a, a shift in, into this space. I, I have to believe there continues to be some concern uh, for people entering the profession, worrying about where this takes their world. I mean, I think the distribution of more accessible care, certainly on a worldwide basis. I mean, we, we when you talk about equally dis distributed failure, that's true in the US, even more so internationally. So tremendous opportunity. But how do you talk to your colleagues who must think about this, you know, in the same way that I, I guess car manufacturers or people that worked on a production line have seen their roles replaced? Where do you, how do you sort of focus that conversation um, with individuals that are, are struggling with this? And great question, you know, about uh, the developing world that you mentioned, especially, we have a great partnership with Orbis, which is called the Flying Eye Hospital. You may have heard about them. And we have, for example, um, an installation in Bangladesh, and we're seeing the same advantages already. And we are actually doing a randomized clinical trial there also to look at how do we pay for this, how does this work for both for, uh, you know, a young startup like us, as well as uh, for, you know, a, a, a pretty low income country. 
and we want to make this work and we're doing this in other countries in the developing world as well so yes we, we're seeing that um i'm very proud that i'm uh, an educator i train uh residents and fellows at iowa one of the leading ophthalmology programs in the world i consider it and so we have these discussions frequently especially you know in fact we had this weekend when there was a, a small conference and so one is uh as we see more patients getting um the diagnostic exams especially right now that they need we will actually see an influx of more patients deserving our care so be sure that you know how to treat these patients focus on the treatment about interventions that only you a highly qualified and also highly paid my sa uh, specialist can do so yes there's concern on the lower end of the diagnostic scale but it's actually not where residents and young people in training want to be they want to do the most difficult tasks and you can see that it's actually expanding every patient that is currently not getting the diagnosis they need chance of actually needing the care it's typically 10 to 20 percent in our case and so you know if you have 10 patients there's already one patient more that needs this high quality care so yes there's a shift the patient mix will change our our, our jobs will become more challenging because we will need to actually use our skills uh, I think that's what everyone is excited about in, in these professions. So I, I think good times, but, you know, certainly some challenges, particularly as you think back to the medical educational system that in, in some respects is mismatched to that, particularly, you know, for folks that are not finding those opportunities to ascend the ladder of skills Um and my suspicion, well, actually my knowledge is based on, you know, my own daughter who's just been through this, there is nothing in terms of an education around these concepts and being able to manage them. How do I deal with, you know, patients that are essentially being referred? So that feels like a, an essential component that we ought to be focusing very hard on at this point. Yeah, well, to A, you know, what is the job situation for physicians going to be? Um how do we prepare them and train them for that? And that's that's happening. There's actually a, a, a board for artificial intelligence in medicine that is very focused on, on education. There's another aspect, which is that physicians that use this on the patients need to be really keen on understanding what AI is appropriate for the patients. How do they know it's safe? How do they know it's, it's, there's a racial or ethnic bias or not? How do they evaluate their systems? And right now, there is high level evidence. The FDA sort of knows how to do it, but physicians need to be trained to learn to do this ourselves. Just like they evaluate any other procedure or even a drug that they use for their patients, they need to be able to understand clinical trials, the evidence that is out there. And I think we can do a better job in, in medical school, especially, but also in a residency program where we focus a lot on this to train you know, young physicians and upcoming physicians and, and residents and fellows uh, you know, to become better and more comfortable at this. Fantastic. Thanks very much for joining me, Michael. It was a pleasure uh, being doing this. Thanks so much. While concern remains high amongst healthcare professionals, it is possible to navigate a path capitalizing on innovation that allows for healthcare to be more equally distributed by bringing down the cost of services. Building in metrics for ethics that ensure that technology is implemented and measured, not just for the value it brings, but including how the technology meets clearly defined ethical principles that protects the patient from harm or malfeasance. If we release technology into the delivery system that is autonomous, it must be delivered to the same standards we hold the rest of society to, including liability and responsibility. We can have automation that augments our existing resources in healthcare, but as Michael pointed out, the benchmark for technology is not to the clinical resources, but rather to the clinical outcome. We know our system misses many opportunities for positive intervention, delivering great health care, but not always equally or uniformly distributed. Your better pill to swallow is to incorporate AI and technology into your organization with transparency and based on ethics. Capitalize on the frameworks that have already been developed that detail the regulatory environment, detail the metrics for ethics that provide a means of measuring and demonstrating safety, efficacy, and outcomes. This approach will bring your clinicians along 
as they see their opportunities for expanding their areas of work and reaching more patients with better care. Thanks for joining me, your host, Dr. Nick, on this week's edition of Healthcare Upside Down. Until next week, keep solving the business of healthcare as if your life depended on it, as one day soon, it will. That's all the time we have for today. You can find all of our episodes on your favorite listening platform by searching for Healthcare Now Radio. Also, check out our blog at ecgmc.com slash hud for summaries and commentary from each episode. Follow our show's social hashtag, HC Upside Down. And join us each week as we work to solve the business of healthcare for everyone.